Okay. There's that audio there should be good. Ready to make a painting? <laughs> okay. Good afternoon everyone. My name is Michael Markowski. Welcome to my studio here in beautiful Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada. Today we're going to be making another painting by one of my all-time very favorite artists. I remember growing up with a print of this artist's work in my parents' house, seeing it every day, loving the color, loving the lines, and I've fallen in love with this artist since I was a young age, and still to this day, uh, he remains one of my all-time favorite artists. We are talking about the one and only Ted Harrison. And this is the painting that we're about to make today. This is called Evening Lover's Walk in the Wilderness. And I would say this is pretty typical of his work. Uh, the colors are very strong, very bright, solid colors. There's not 
really any blending of colors. All the colors are sort of separated into their own spaces and outlined. And uh, there's often, in many of his works, I've seen this particular composition, this motif of people walking through this these rolling hills in towards the distance with these bright uh, sunsets happening off in the distance. Now, Ted Harrison is, is particularly identified with the Yukon and the Canadian Arctic where he lived for, how, I think about 25, 30 years or so. Uh, from, I think, the mid-1960s till the early 1990s, 1993, I think, is when he moved from uh, in the Yukon White Horse area, or Car Cross, I think, is where he lived, down to Victoria, British Columbia, where he kind of set up an art gallery and retired to. Uh, so, potentially, this is not just a sunset, but what is known as the Midnight Sun. Um, I've, I spent a couple of weeks at the North Pole, like literally on the top of the earth uh, as part of the Canadian Forces Artist Program or the War Artist Program a few years ago and, I, and I've also been to Dawson City in the Yukon and seen the sun when it's up all night long uh, and it is a beautiful experience. Anyway, we are going to make this painting today as well as possibly this painting. I'm going to get them both started uh, I think I'll probably make this one second, just because I, I... He's so many great... As I said, I grew up with this artist, and I love this artist, and I thought, you know what? I also really like this image as well. So I think I'm, I'm going to try to do both of them. We'll get one of them started. We'll take it to beginning to end, and then if you want to stay tuned and make a second painting with me, or just tune in at the second half of the episode, you're welcome to do that as well. So I'll let you know that there are outlines for both of these paintings and I've already got them on my canvases you can print them out on your your printer or photocopy machine at work or uh, at your local library and then transfer them onto canvas I'll show you how to do that in just a second I'll show you where to find these because you're like where do okay that's really cool where do I find it well there's a Dropbox link in the description below and you'll see in that Dropbox link, look at all these folders. These are all artists that we've already painted. If you're really interested in uh, Ted Harrison, a few people you might really like would be Sherry Boyle. We did a, a big wave painting of hers. Um, who else has really bright colors like that? Well, we did some comic book oriented artwork. We did Batman. We did Star Wars, but that's it, it looks very different than this. Um, Yayoi Kasuma, very bright colors. And Peppa Pig, obviously. Superman, very bright colors. Uh, the Miriam Shapiro, that was a really cool one. Also used a little bit of collage. Anyway, if we keep on scrolling down here, you'll see we pass uh, Tom Thompson and Vincent Van Gogh, whom we both did full weeks dedicated to the artwork. So Van Gogh, who actually shares a lot of similarities with Ted Harrison, or I would say Ted Harrison was deeply inspired by Vincent Van Gogh and Van Gogh's use of color and outlining of forms and shapes. That brings us right here to Ted Harrison. We jump in here. You'll see that there's six files in this folder. There's two versions of these outlines. There's a JPEG and a PDF. Right, so that accounts for four of the files, and then there's five and six. So if you're wondering what all those files are in the folder, I'll just also, while we're just kind of on here, I'll just mention that there's a private Facebook group just for people like you watching. I would love it if at the end of today's episode, after you've painted today's paintings, is to take a photo of them and upload them to the Facebook page next week. <laughs> I think it's the 18th or something of August. Uh, or not this coming weekend, but the weekend after. There's a feedback session coming up and where I just I bring all of the work that you guys have created over the past few months. We take a look at it, including the paintings you guys are making on your own time, and upload them here to the Facebook group. I just saw this right before we uh, went to film here. Sandra Pandra's uh, question. We'll just zoom in. 
She says, I'm having issues with flowers in the meadow of my pond. How can I create depth in the curb? I get confused using cool and warm colors still. Um, when I'm doing the flowers in the front, am I only supposed to use only warm colors and the receding med meadow only use cool colors? I think my values are a bit out of whack to help Michael Markowski. <laughs> so some great, that's a, there's some great stuff in this. And, uh, I think I'll talk about it a little bit in today's episode. But on our feedback session, I'll maybe dive in and talk a little bit more specifically about this question, Sandra. But that is something I'm sure probably most people watching today have similar questions about. Let's just quickly jump in here and talk a little bit about Ted Harrison, uh, his biography. Born in 1926 in England, he came to Canada, I think, when uh, for his bachelor of education at the University of Alberta, I think in the early 1960s, like 1964, is it? I think if I recall, something around there. And after he graduated, he was looking for a job and uh, the Yukon is always looking for people to go up to the Yukon. And so he moved up there in 1968 and as I said, stayed there until 93 or something around there. So he spent, yeah, uh, a you know, a good chunk of his adult life in the Yukon, uh, and I was just watching an interview, and he had a funny way of saying Yukon, it was, uh, you, you can, you can or something, I think is what he said, uh, yeah, with a British accent, I'd never heard somebody pronounce it that way, so it's, it's worth, actually, it's in this interview right here, if you want to check it out, um, he was being interviewed on local Canadian television, he seems like, he was a really happy, positive guy, uh, full of life and energy and happiness and joy. And uh, you know, though I, as I said, I spent uh, I spent a couple of months as an artist in residence in Dawson City, and fell in love. I think every Canadian should at one point visit Dawson City. Uh, Dawson City, in my mind, is represents what most Canadians imagine Canada is like it's like the it's like the mythical this mythical Canada I don't know and I think it's what a lot of people outside of Canada imagine Canada as being so it's it's a really wonder wonderful place uh, great people up there okay so I could talk let me just show a couple of things here's his uh, the website that his official website where you can buy uh, artwork of his um, books and prints. I strongly recommend if you are become a fan, if you're already a fan of Ted Harrison, I don't need to convince you, you're already converted, but if you've seen him for the very first time, my goodness, you are you are in for some really cool time today. So, uh, let's um, let me share with you uh, this, I'm going I'm to show you how to outline that file, which I, uh, the, the, the files on the Dropbox, which you can download for free. I'm going to talk over top of this video here while, um, while I'm just doing the outline, just going to show you a little bit about how it's done. If you want to buy this exact same nine by 12 sized, uh, uh, canvas panel or canvas board, you can uh, order them using the drop or the Amazon link in the description. You can see that I printed out on just regular paper. Actually, I used I, I just like thicker cardstock paper, but uh, it's actually easier to do this process using thinner paper, like photocopy paper, just because you don't have to press quite so hard. Uh, here you can see I'm putting the the paper down, and then just there's this horizon line in the middle, and I was just trying to make sure it was as close to straight as possible. It doesn't have to be perfectly straight. You can always adjust those lines later, but it certainly helps. And then you can see I'm taking this carbon paper. You can buy carbon paper at any art supply store or even fabric stores, because people use it to transfer patterns onto fabric and then cut them out and sew them together. And there's also, of course, a, a Amazon link in the description below if you want to order uh, some. And you can use that same carbon paper dozens, well, probably about 20 times, at, and then you're probably going to want to swap it out, depending on how complex the images are that you are drawing. 
here you'll see I, I did this uh, uh, circle for the sun and kind of went around and around and around a few different times. So let's just kind of skip ahead here. You think you get the pretty the gist. You'll see that I just moved the carbon paper down on the bottom and then that way it allows me to kind of go off the paper and get that little bit extra on the sides. These details in the figures, we'll get to that. And let me see. Skip forward and then you can see. But uh when you're done, you can just peel that right off and you can reuse it. Let's do here's another one. Here's the one of the cat with the crows. I think they're they're crows. Are they ravens or crows? Um this one doesn't really have quite such a definite horizon line on it, so you, you can pretty much just slap it anywhere on there. Go over all your lines. You see, I didn't bother doing the uh, the dots of snow there, because that'll just be uh, or something we would do near the very, very end of this particular painting. But I did do, like, these are thick black outlines, and I did kind of outline the inside and outside, just to give me an idea how thick those lines should ultimately be. And then, boom, we just peel it off, we put our carbon paper away, and we're all done, right? So by the end, you will have something like this, and something like this. Okay, I like to keep these and give them to our daughter to draw on and color on, or you can use them to practice mixing your paint on, or you can just do the earth a favor and put them in your recycling box and uh, or you can also put them on multiple canvases and try the same painting over and over until you're happy with the results okay so I see a question in the chat there from Heidi already I'll get to that in a second let's get some paint onto the canvas and get this ball a rolling so, <clears throat> my goodness, it is hot in here. I'm just going to put my ice pack up. Top. <clears throat> I have to f I figure out a better system here. I was looking at fans um, on to, to attach to these cameras because... Man, this summer, it has been a bit of a struggle with the heat. And my studio is like the coldest place in town in winter. It's one of those, these, the house that we live in is, you know, one of these old houses that gets really cold in the winter and really hot in the summer. Okay, I'm going to put some warm yellow down onto this palette to get started. This is what I, I typically do at the beginning of every painting that we do. I have done a, a little bit of different colors over the past while. How many paintings have we done here? This is painting, what is it, 109? <laughs> so I've done 109 paintings. I'd say probably about... Um, 90 of them or, or 88 or something around there I've used this warm yellow and a little bit of white as a wash to go over top of the the pencil lines so this is sort of almost it's kind of becoming kind of like my trademark uh, Typically, I, I mean, I don't think that Ted Harrison would have put this warm yellow on his canvas to get started. Uh, he, pr I think he probably was painting directly with onto the white canvas. Um, <clears throat> wipe off that yellow paint before I put it onto my camera again. Uh, so the, the question would be like if t if Ted Harrison didn't do it that way why are why am I doing it that way or why would I suggest you do it that way you don't have to do it like this 
I I just find I really like it's gonna slip off, isn't it? Um See how long that lasts up there. Um, uh, you, you don't have to put this yellow down. I just, it's, these, ep these classes have begun to morph for me from just teaching to really solidifying a theory and a, a approach to painting that is, um, that is definitely my own, but it's using a lot of my own research into color theory that I've been doing over the past 20 years. Uh, I do teach art at Emily Carr University uh, of Art and Design here in Vancouver. Uh, it's um, arguably one of the best art schools in North America, certainly here in Canada. Um, if I was doing a more advanced painting, what I would probably do is mix a brown uh, or warm earthy red instead of yellow. But I actually quite like this yellow, especially just to kind of get started for our purpose. It gives things a bit of like a, a nice warm glow, kind of that Kodachrome kind of quality. So your blues are a little bit more... Uh, deep and intense it gives the the reds a little bit more orange you know it's, it's got that that like Instagram yellow filter which is you know a bit of a, a um, something that people like these days so I, it's as much as I like to think I come up with my own ideas I might just be a product of our particular time um, but anyway, I've, over the past year that we've been painting together, we're almost at a, our year anniversary, it seems to work really well, and so I'm just, I'm just going to go with it until I, I start painting paintings where it doesn't seem to work so much. So, anyway, I'm just going to wipe this down, clean my workspace up a little bit here. And then I'm going to blow dry both of these paintings so that I lock in this nice warm yellow. Okay. Just going to mute the microphone for a second. Okay, so we got these um, all prepped, ready to paint. As I said, this one here of the cat and the... Let me see, is it... what? It's just called Snow Cat, so I'm not sure if they're ravens or crows. Um, when I was in Dawson City, there were these... Now I'm trying to think, were they ravens or giant crows? I remember we were, I was living in this... Uh, they have an artist residency called Kayak, Klondike... Uh, Klondike Institute 
for art and culture or something. I, or, I, or, anyway, I can't remember how, how they make that acronym work. But it was in the old mayor's house in Dawson City. And it had this, a lot of houses have tin roofs because they had a, a couple fires that that basically destroyed the whole town because once those the ambers fly and land on other houses, they burn the roof down and everything burnt down. So the I think almost every house there might even have to have like a tin or metal roof. But it's really wild when you're uh, like I'd be laying in bed and then you hear the sound of these the claws of the birds on the on the roofs tick 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 it sounds like you're in a horror movie and it's like a giant alien scraping across the roof the first time you hear it it, it sits you up straight in your bed <laughs> um and I, i'm trying to remember i think they are there they might be ravens i you know i just can't remember but they are big birds whatever <laughs> big black birds that uh, uh, are kind of like the, um, besides people, they're like the, the main um, alpha dogs up there. Okay. So how come I got paint ever? Oh, that's because my ice pack fell down and knocked everything over. That's I'm like, why is there all my supplies all a big mess? Oh, uh, yeah, it's because I so just organize things a little bit here. Okay, so um, and I, that's a great question in the chat, Heidi. I saw that as I was blow drying. So I'll, let me, uh, your question, Heidi asks, Michael, what is the best medium to use to protect acrylic paintings? Would matte medium be considered an option? Thank you. Okay, great question. And so typically, so, so one of the, I, I don't know exactly why you would be asking that, but I, uh, I imagine it's because, you know, acrylic painting, you know, when it dries, it is usually, it's, uh, it turns to plastic. Acrylic is, a pla is plastic, right? It's, uh, acrylic paint is basically plastic in, in liquid form. And when you, when you put it out onto a palette or a canvas, when the, it hits some oxygen, the water evaporates and it solidifies and turns into plastic. If you uh, if you let it sit for a couple of days, usually that plastic um, solidifies completely and is pretty relatively uh, impervious to water and other types of damage having said that if if you were to make a painting with acrylic and you were to accidentally splash coffee on it or it's in your in your kitchen and you get spaghetti sauce on it and you go to get a rag you get some water on it and you're wiping that spaghetti sauce off and oh my goodness I don't just have spaghetti sauce on my cloth I've got some blue and green and orange and <gasps> Uh oh, uh, and you get into that situation <laughs> that Mr. Bean was in in the Mr. Bean movie where he wipes off the face of uh, Whistler's mother, a painting which we did, by the way. Uh, and so, how do you prevent that? How do how do you prevent the paint from being wiped off? So. Traditionally, what artists use is varnish, and varnish uh, is a material that there's different types of varnish. Different companies make you know with, with different um, materials inside. And th anyway, the intent of varnish is to sort of seal in the paint, so that if you did get spaghetti sauce on it. You you would you could feel pretty comfortable taking a rag and wiping it off, right? Because um, maybe maybe you know how to care for your painting, but maybe you've got children or you're running an Airbnb and you don't want to have to explain to people, hey, by the way, if you get spaghetti sauce on the paintings, don't wipe it off with a cloth. You know, give me a call first, right? 
So varnish is intended to kind of protect the painting, seal it in from any kind of, of damage. The great thing with varnishes is that they can also be removed. You might have seen like documentaries where they're restoring or cleaning an old painting and they might show kind of a before and after and the origin or the, the sort of before the painting looks really yellow and green and then they and the colors are really muted and then they show the after and all of a sudden the colors look rich and beautiful um, many classic paintings like that had varnish on them and when they were removed they almost looked like different paintings right because varnish traditional varnish was organic and just like anything organic it will deteriorate over time right but the great thing with most varnishes is they can be removed now you can you can buy varnish at your art supply store there's acrylic varnish or, or like water-based varnish and there are oil-based varnishes and both of them should be removable maybe not by you but maybe some curator 20 years 200 years in the future right so that would be your ideal thing is to put a varnish over top of your painting so that uh, it, it is more resistant to any particular kind of damage um, now your Heidi asked can I use uh, acrylic medium like matte medium like do I have some matte medium here So a couple things, like things that would be similar to, so here is some matte medium here. Matte medium is a, is essentially acrylic paint without any color in it. It's going to dry clear and it will work pretty good as a, as a quote unquote varnish to seal your painting in. Same thing with Mod Podge. This is just the gloss version. You can get a, um, a matte version, so you have a glossy or the non-shiny matte version, right? Both both of these kinds of things will work. Now, the thing with these, the big asterisk is they cannot be removed in the future. So you could seal it, but somebody in the future won't be able to, to take it off. And you probably like, well, that okay, great. I, why would anybody want to take it off? Well, it is, these aren't necessarily made to be used as varnish, so it is possible, especially Mod Podge. I don't know if it's made to be particularly archival. It's made to last for a couple of years, but whether it's going to last 200 years is debatable. And I know some people are like, well, I don't need it to last 200 years. I don't know if it's going to be that good, if it's going to be passed down generation to generation. But it is a concern for somebody, particularly as you're getting more involved in painting and you want to... Um, to uh, preserve your paintings so i would say varnish would be is your is your number one choice if you want something just to kind of quickly seal it so you put it in your kitchen and you don't have to worry about splatters or um, baby food or whatever getting on it then yes your a matte medium or mod podge would probably be uh, acceptable alternatives I guess that's a long way of answering that. Um, Gail says, varnish turns yellow, though, doesn't it? Uh, if varnish will, well, you know, a lot of new varnish uh, claims to be relatively stable and that it won't yellow or at least won't yellow as quickly as traditional varnishes. But um, we just don't know. You know, if somebody invents something you know, a couple of years ago and says it's going to be perfect for the next 200 years. You're like, how, how do they know this is going to be good for 200? Like, <laughs> um, I don't know exactly how they test that theory. Uh, but yes, you're right. Yeah, varnish traditionally does yellow. But if it's removable, then once it yellows, it can somebody can take the, the varnish off and restore it. Off the top of my head, I, I, who would be able to do that? There would be only very few, like, I'm sure if you go call up, like, an auction house, like Bonhams or Heffel or 
Christie's. They probably could put you in touch with a, a restorer who could do that. Okay, let's get into the painting. But those are great questions, really great questions. Okay, so let's take a look at the painting. And think about how we're going to paint it. So, this is an interesting artwork because the way that Harrison paints with these kind of outlines means that we don't necessarily have to work background to foreground in the manner that we've been painting really for the past hundred paintings. So typically what I would do is I would start, I would maybe paint you know, the sky, almost work my way down like a printer, because usually the top of the painting is your background, and by the bottom of the painting is your foreground, right? As in this image here, right? This is, would be your furthest uh, things, the sky, and then uh, the, the horizon line with this mountain, and then I, I assume this is a lake or a trail or a field, I'm not sure, and then these hills, and then these figures would be your foreground subject. Um, but because of the way it's painted, we really could do anything in any order. The only thing I would say is that we, you could do, you could paint the sun and then the, the sky and then these, this mountain here. And then the last thing I would probably do would be the people. So there, there, there isn't such a crucial, um, order for this particular artwork, but... It still might, uh, um, I think, just because of the way that I've got my sun here, the way that I kind of sloppily did this sun, I might actually just start right there, and then that way I can kind of clean it up as I do the sky around it, so... Uh, but I could see anybody starting anywhere, like mixing blues and doing all of this, and doing a yellow and working your way up. I also find it easier to start up here because that way I can paint and as I move down my hand isn't sitting on wet paint. Like if I start down here then I'm gonna have to do some gymnastics to get up here without getting paint all over my sleeve. So anyway I just like to try to explain my thought process as often as possible so that especially new painters have some insight into why a painter does what in what particular order. So that sun is obviously a pink, right? Now what, how do we make that pink? Because you've probably, you saw that on my palette, we've got six colors plus white here, right? We don't have any black, because I don't think he used black in this painting. Maybe even that hair is kind of a dark blue. So we have two yellows, two reds, two blues. We've got a warm yellow and a cool yellow, warm red and a cool red, a warm blue and a cool blue, right? And typically we wanna use our cool colors in the background and warm colors in the foreground. That's typically how artists, uh, especially classical Western artists, that's the tradition that's been passed down for the past 700 or so years and it is based on actual uh, like perceptual theory like uh, uh, color theory and th and the way that the eyes perceive color is that co cool colors if you put those two colors side by side the cool color tends to look like it's further backwards in distance and the warm color tends to kind of come towards us so even just putting those two colors side by side you can get this, what's called the push-pull effect. And artists like Mark Rothko and abstract painters who are doing so-called color field painters really embraced the, the warm and cool color theory um, to help create this almost vibrant quality or vibrating quality in the, the mind of the viewer. So again, we have two reds. If we, we know that if we add white to these reds, we're gonna get a pink, right? But it's gonna, but the pink will be different depending on which red we choose here, right? If we put this white in, in fact, let's just do a quick little demo just so you can see here. If we add some of the 
white to the warm red. We get that type of um, of pink versus if we take some white and add it to the cool red, we get this type of color. And the good thing about mixing, adding white to your color is sort of a great secret, uh, like a, a shortcut to help you determine whether a color is warm or cold. Because when you add white to it, it can kind of a little bit reveal uh, the some of the properties of the color. So when I add some white to, let's say the, the, the red here, what you want to be looking for is, is there any kind of an orangey quality to that color, right? Because warm, warm colors have orangey uh, qualities, right? That's what, that's sort of the definition of a warm color. It's got some orangey pigments in it versus a cool color has some yellow and greenish qualities to it. And if we think about like the the way that the color wheel works is as we add white to this cool red, it starts to kind of look almost like purpley, right? It, it starts, it, we can feel it moving towards the, the warm blue. So anyway, that's just a quick little um, uh, refresher. So if we, again, if we look at these two colors on the screen here, which color would you want to paint that sun? Now, just based on what we just mixed here, it should be pretty clear that we want to use the cool red because it looks a lot more like what we see on screen versus the warm red with the white in it. It's It looks a little bit more kind of, um, I guess, a little bit more orangey or peachy, right? more like the blush on someone's face, perhaps. Okay, so we're gonna use this magenta or cool red to do the um, to do the sun here. So how about, let's start out with some of the cool red. We're gonna add some white to it. And let's zoom in on that as well. Oops. So I'm going to paint the bottom here uh, the cool red with just a little bit of white in there. Now I'm just going to add a bit more white to it. And don't worry about the actual shape of this circle because we can um, go in and kind of clean it up with other the other colors uh, around it. So now let's take even more white. And if you do this and you realize like, oh, I, there was too much of a jump between one to the other, that's all right. We may even need to do a second coat of this anyway, so it'll give you an opportunity to practice this. And then let's do another one with kind of most, a lot more white. even more to give it a bit more of a so that these two on the top especially don't have quite as much of a difference as I would like so I think we'll we'll fix that later 
Okay, that's a, that's a good start. We're, we're already beginning the painting. Now, as I said, um, I I just want to get things going. You, this is some. I, I I know I say this almost every episode, is that I don't. I'm not going to fixate on getting this perfect and getting the right things because I'm I'm probably going to have to do a second coat on a lot of this painting. So really, it's an opportunity for you to sort of practice a little bit, but don't sit there fixating and like, ah, oh, okay, now I'm gonna go mix that again. Just do your best, get it started. It's almost like a placeholder for the next little bit here. Uh, if you had a little bit more confidence, you could even just paint this, maybe the lighter pink with some white in it and just let it dry and then move forward. Okay, so. The next step is, well, we have this kind of orange that's uh, down here, and it's not, it's kind of more like a peachy color. So I think that peachy color, let's see if we add some cool yellow to it, what will happen? Oh, sorry, can't see. Pretty close, right? So we add some cool yellow. Just add a little more here. And then we'll add a bit more white. Now I'm just gonna add make a bigger batch here because we got kind of a big surface to cover. So let's just take bit more of each of these and mix them together. So this is cool yellow and warm red. Or sorry, cool yellow and cool red. My apology. And how about let's go up here. I'm gonna zoom out a little bit. There we go. You also see that I'm using a, a pretty large brush to do this. I'm not uh, going to obsess over tiny details until later on in the painting. So I'll say, you know, the, the this sort of system that I've been developing over these episodes, you know, it's sort of like I've been painting this way for, I don't know how many, 25 years, but, um, you know, when you have to teach something, you, you end up trying to, like, formalize what you, you know into something that can be as easily explained as possible. And, you know, my, this system... Be especially because we put this yellow down first, will usually require, depending on the colors we use, that you do two coats of each color. If we were just to paint directly onto a white canvas, it is possible that we might be able to get away with just one coat of color on there. And th there's pros and cons to, to that. One is that uh, obviously, if you just have to do one coat of paint, well, then things go faster. I think it's debatable. I think you, even if we painted this white, we may even still want to do a second coat. Um, but I, I personally, either way, I really like doing two coats of paint because it's going to make that color a little bit richer. And it also provides the opportunity for us to not just do the same paint twice, but to modify those colors a little bit to create different kinds of visual effects. Now, so like what we have here is I can paint this in really quickly without too much worry of getting it quote unquote right, right off the beginning. I just kind of throw colors in there. And if I'm, if I'm just 
lucky and you know I've got I, I have 25 years of painting experience under my belt so I'm I have a kind of intuitive knowledge about how to use paint that just comes from making a ton of mistakes right uh, and part of me teaching here is to try to help sh shorten your own mistake making period um, and by sharing with you what I know um, but I, I also think it, there is a lot of value because I think most people want to be able to they just want the experience of painting freely and quickly and if at least at the beginning first hour or so of that painting is you're just like yeah I'm just gonna I can just go quickly I can make a bit of a mess it doesn't have to be precise that is like a big load off of your shoulders when you're like okay this is the what we call the un, literally what we call our underpainting, the painting that goes underneath the finished painting, and the underpainting is usually very kind of quickly done, very expressive. Like literally, if you look at the at the underpaintings of Rembrandt or um, who would be another great example, Rembrandt in particular. Renoir, a lot of the impressionist painters, like things are just like quickly like uh, painted in. And that gives you that that fun, expressive thing right like you're being shot out of the cannon where you can play with the paint. and then slowly things get more refined towards the end. Anyway, let's uh, go on. Uh, let's we're gonna mix here our own gray here. So for the these stripes in the the I think I guess they're kind of clouds maybe in the sky, and uh, to do that, as you may know from past episodes, what we're going to do is we're going to take some cold blue, and then we're going to reach across all the way to the other side here to the warm red, because when we mix these two colors together, we get a really dark color, a really dark brownish gray, muddy, you know, color devoid of much uh, intensity. Because literally they're almost virtually across the color wheel from one another. Right? And so this would be this is a great color that we can do for uh, I think it's there's a character in the bottom with dark hair, so we could use that for that. When we paint the the cat and the crows, we can use this for outlining and for the crows. But here we can now take this color, and let's uh, where should we, let's do this right next door here, and we can just add some white to it and convert this into a gray. All right, and it will, it's going to be a bit of a purpley gray because there's no real yellow in here. I mean, there is a tiny bit of yellow, orangey quality from the warm red, um, but if we wanted to make this a bit more of a brownish gray or a greenish gray, we just add a little bit more yellow or add some yellow into this mixture. This gives us a pretty good start. So, what I'm going to do here, I'm going to take, uh, I've just mixed that color, I'm going to wipe my brush off. Take a little bit more white paint, and then mix this together. And I think this is maybe my darker color. We'll see. So again, you can see that I'm not too concerned about the ex getting the exact shapes perfect. Just want to fill in the spaces, and if I want to change that, I can do that later. Now I notice as I'm painting it that it's gonna it maybe should be a little bit more purpley, but you know what? I think I'll just do that 
a, a, another stage here. I'm just going to keep on going forward with this. I'm just going to add more white to the color. You know, what's fun about, you know, when I was putting together this episode, just doing a little bit of research, I saw that many of the episodes that already exist on, like, painting, Ted Harrison paintings, which there's actually a number of them, but almost every single one is geared towards children. Um, which doesn't surprise me, because there's something very... Um, uh, I don't want to say childlike, but these like bold colors, the simplicity of the forms definitely reminds me a lot of like children's book illustration. Never mind the fact that, you know, arguably uh, Ted Harrison's most famous um, artwork is the illustrations he did. He did for a few different books, but primarily for Robert Service's uh, poem, The Cre Cremation of uh, Dan McGee. Is it Dan McGee? Why was it? Um, which uh, is this is this poem of this... Now I'm trying to remember. It's been years since I read it. It's, 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 isn't it like a bad dude who gets who dies in a fire on a boat or something. I don't think it's really a kid's story. Um, but uh, anyway, the he illustrated that poem. A book was published of, uh, with those, those paintings that he made and was widely distributed. I have... I've, you know, I've gone to dozens of people's houses and seen it on bookshelves or coffee tables. It's one of those um, those books that is uh, particularly for a particular period of time and Canadian social life was all over the place. Everybody had a copy of it. Which is like another book that I saw somebody posted a quote of on the Facebook group from The Artist's Way uh, by Julie Cameron, I think, who made that. Um, that was another book that had like, you know, was very popular at one point. And you, you can find that book often in used bookstores. Okay. So... The, one of the again, one of the reasons why I wanted to to paint it like this and why I like having two layers is it's still a little bit sloppy, but by painting this in, it gives me an opportunity to kind of tighten up this shape, and then when I do a second version over top, which I think I, I still will do, I can make that that sun look much better the second time around. I might even, I can enlarge it, I could shrink it, but certainly what I would do is just paint a little bit over some of the edges on the sides, which is always why it's a good reason just to kind of go in a little bit closer over top of your lines. But let's press forward here and do the uh, orange mountains here. Now, I'm just going to paint orange right up to this line, and then I'm going to put a white border uh, or, or white line over top of it rather than trying to make a uh, you know paint very closely here you know like that would just be a nightmare just take me way too much time and I don't want to spend my time doing that kind of stuff so let's take our warm yellow and warm red and we're gonna mix an orange let's 
pretty good, right? And let's just paint that right in here. And because we're going to paint a line uh, dividing this, a border around this color, or dividing the colors, we can be especially kind of sloppy because that line is going to cover up any kind of mistakes that we might make, I guess you could say. Versus these lines where there is no, like I could put a white border on here and that would instantly clean up that circle. Right, so if, if for instance, you you by while you're making in, any either of these paintings in the style of Ted Harrison, and you just start losing your mind because trying to kind of get those col nice colors to match up side by side isn't working out for you, then you can easily just put a white or black or green border around it, and boom, it looks perfect. Right? Okay. Now this color, I'm pretty sure, is just a, a warm yellow on its own. But I'm going to suggest, because we've just painted this orange, that I'm just going to um, move down. Well, let's see. If, I, if I'm careful, I won't get it all over the place. I won't mix it in. Now there's a bit of red on my brush as I was dipping into the paint there. So I'm just trying to avoid getting some of that that paint all over the brush. Um, oh, it looks like I forgot a line, right? So I'm going to paint this in here. You can see I'm going over top of some of the pencil lines which is fine the only thing that I want to try to avoid is some big ridges of paint so and you see me sometimes doing this where I just take my finger and I'm rubbing out extra those smoothing things down The blue we put over top of it has white in it, so it's going to cover up any of the sloppiness that we might make along the way. Okay. I might this is might be definitely something we could use a second coat. If you're in a super hurry, probably what I would suggest you do, you could even just, if you're happy with the way that looks, you can just probably just blow dry that yellow, put a second coat on it right now, and then you'd be done with it. I'm going to do that all together later on. So now let's paint some blues. Now, it looks like these. this blue is a cool blue with some white in it. So let's get some cool blue with white so you know Sandra in the in the on the Facebook group asked like can I only do I only use uh, warm colors in the foreground and cool colors in the background and the answer is no you don't have to paint that way like if you don't want to use I mean, there's, there are, I would say the, the vast majority of artists don't even know about warm and cool colors. So the, it's not even a question of obeying the rules and breaking the rules. And, and they just don't even know about it. They've never heard about it before. It's total news to them. You know, a lot, there's a lot of artists that never went to art school, that never had anybody tell them any of this stuff. So it's just, it's, they, they break the rule all the time. Um, there's lots of artists at the turn of the last century, and like uh, cubist artists, avant-garde artists, who deliberately played with those conventions and put deliberately put cool colors in the foreground and warm colors in the background in order to uh, create sort of 
uh, sometimes like disconcerting effects. Like I think the, one of the like a couple people spring to mind. Uh, uh, Edvard Munch, the painter most famous for the scream, ah, right. He he definitely was playing with warm and cool colors and a putting in some uh, uh, cool colors and warm colors, like putting cool colors in the foreground and warm colors in the background in order to help the painting have that the same effect. That the, 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 you know, like the figure screaming, it's it's this person having this existential meltdown, right? So he wanted the painting also itself to embody the feelings of, of that person, right? So that you might, as a viewer, also feel a little bit like, oh my goodness, this painting's making me dizzy. I think you may notice that this area is a little bit more green. That's just because that yellow paint was still wet, and so I'm painting into wet paint, and, and the blue and yellow are going to make a little bit of green, right? Um, I'm probably going to do a second coat, or at least some touch-ups here and there. So I'm not really, I don't really care. I, if I was maybe a little bit more patient, I'd blow dry it, and then I would put that paint there, but I'm not going to be too concerned. Um, okay, let's take this same color let's add I'm just gonna make this you can see here's the one with some white I'm taking the same brush I haven't added any uh, I haven't washed it or anything I'm just gonna paint this side by side let's take a look Um, when my grandmother was in a senior's home in Victoria, before she passed away last year, she took painting classes with this really nice fellow who was a pretty accomplished painter himself. Um, and when I went and visited my grandmother, she was painting Ted Harrison uh, paintings. She had a calendar of Ted Harrison's, and she was making paintings very similar to this. And her and I collaborated on a few paintings like this. So that's another, a whole other reason why uh, Ted Harrison is has a special place in my heart. Is one of the final things my grandmother and I did together is made a collaborative Ted Harrison painting because her vision was was going and it was hard for her to see and it was hard for her to you know mix paints with any level of subtlety or nuance but a Ted Harrison painting you know it's fairly bold striking colors and so that made it a lot easier for her to to get that painting done so uh, I just have like real fond memories of us working on a painting together I think when I was in art school, I did a lot of collaborative artworks with people. Um, throughout my career, I've collaborated with different businesses and institutions, organizations, uh, other artists, musicians. I've toured the, across Canada twice with uh, a rock band doing artwork, live artwork while they were playing. So I really enjoy that kind of thing. Okay, so let's... Um so we've we've been using that cool blue, kind of in the in the middle ground. Let's switch it up to uh, a purple. So this time um, I'm just gonna wipe this paint off, and I'm gonna take some. I should take a bit more of that. Some warm blue and cool red. We're gonna mix together. A purple. The more cool red you put in there, then the more um, the more reddish that purple will be. The more blue in there, the more bluish that purple will be. Right? So it sounds kind of like duh, but 
you know, if you've never done this kind of stuff before, it's all new to you, right? I'm going to start off, I'm actually probably going to paint the bottom shapes first. Because that way I can paint them and just add more white and then get this next shape in here. So we'll we'll see here. So I'm going to add this white in here. Just uh, I find purple if you if you just mix that purple with cool blue and or cool cool red and warm blue together, it's very dark and also very transparent. Um, and it doesn't have quite a, it's not a really nice color to paint with, especially on top of this yellow. And kind of you can see here it's it's this is this version with just a little bit of white anyway and you can see how transparent it is so this is where we'll, I'll do another coat of paint later on And it's obviously much darker. So much so that, you know what? I'm going to take more white right now. I'm going to paint over top of this. So that I'm going to, if I paint this a lighter purple now, when I put the dark, darker purple over top of it, it will look much better. And I won't have to add nearly as much white at all. So... There's a little secret you can take. Even though that's actually pretty close to the color I want now that I look at it on screen, I wasn't even expecting it. But okay, let's do this again on the other side. Obviously, I just painted over his signature there. If you want to paint the signature in, you can do that. I could do that afterwards. Or you can just omit it. Okay, I mean, that's basically the color I wanted. I didn't think there was going to be that much white in it. But uh, now... I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to put more white in here. And I think I'm also just going to take a bit of cool blue and just mix it a bit into this purple. Let's just get a bit more color in here. So that way, I've, I've got a little bit of this color and this color in between so that there, it's not such a leap of between these two colors where you're like whoa that's those two colors you know there's a, a too big of a gap there right this is one way to kind of marry those two very different colors together Right, and I look at it on the screen and I'm like, yeah, I think it needed to be almost a little bit more blue than this kind of purple. Although when I look at my computer screen, I look like, I think I'm closer the color on the computer screen looks closer to the color that I'm painting. The color on the TV screen looks like I've got it all wrong. So you never know. Colors, that's the crazy thing with color, is color will look different to different people. Oh, I just noticed that color, I think, was close to... These two colors are the same. I didn't even realize that was a separate space. Okay. So now, I'll wipe my brush off. I'm just going to take this light blue...
paint that there. And then we've got a pink. Now remember when we, we did way back at the beginning, these two different pinks, the magenta pink using the the cold red, and we added white to it, that's the color we got that we used for the sun. And then we added white to the warm red, and we got this color, which we said, nah, don't we don't quite want to use it. Well, take a look what color he's put down here. Right? It looks, it's, it kind of, you know, if you look at it separately, it looks a lot like the cool color up top. But I think it's, it's actually more like the warm red, which would make sense, right? If we go with this idea of putting our, our warm colors in the foreground and cool colors in the background. So I'm going to take that and let's just zip it in. And I'm gonna I just go especially with like little details like that I'm more likely to paint as close and up to and on top of as much as possible I find this actually easier than noodling around things Okay, so let's just back out for a second and look at these paintings side by side. So, you know, we've been painting for, what, 40 minutes or so, 45 minutes in total, and we're, you know, I could see some people saying I'm, we're really close to being done. If we just paint the figures, do outlines, you could be done. You could be done here in about 20 minutes if you wanted. I personally will probably repeat a bunch of this and go over top of it, and I think it's going to look really cool. Because um, I, you know, as the more and more I've done of these episodes, the more I get into it, and the more I want to just make it as good as I possibly can make it. So I think I'm going to just add a little bit more work into it just to bring it to the, to as high of a quality as possible so that people uh, who are really interested in Ted Harrison's thing, they could say, okay, oh, there's some big water just dripped from the heavens onto the canvas here. From the... Let's move that out of the way. Got my ice pack dripping water. That's how hot it is in here. Um, but as I said, if you want, if you want to just move on and you're done with it, it's doing what you want it to do, then that's great, right? It doesn't matter what I want it to do, what your next door neighbor wants it to do, what your friends on Instagram want it to, it's, it matters what you want it to do, right? That's, at the end of the day, as an artist, you have to satisfy yourself. You are the you really should be the intended audience for your own artwork, right? If it's not making you happy, then why are you doing it? Um, it's not a recipe for a particularly satisfying career or even a hobby for that matter. Even if you're just, you just want to make paintings for fun and you like, if I was making this on my own without the camera and I was painting it, like, what would stop me from putting a dragon flying around in the sky, putting, I don't know, like, uh, a castle here or uh, a, a monster chasing after these people? You can do whatever you want to do. Oh, great. Lots of people watching. So... Um, and probably a lot of people who are new to the channel, if you're new and you're enjoying it, hit the like button, hit the subscribe button, do it right now, because 
it's re it also is a real great way of helping out myself do that for all of the youtubers you watch whenever i just click on a video i pretty much always just hit the like button immediately even before i've watched a second of it right if i don't like it at, by the end i just press the like button again and then right or right so anyway um that's just my that's my public service announcement on behalf of every YouTuber out there. So <laughs> let's just go in here. Also, if you want to support the channel, there is a PayPal link below where you can send a contribution in. Come on. There we go. Focused. Took a little second there for it to think. Okay, so let's do these couple little these lovers walking in the wilderness is what it's called but do you see any trees in here i don't but that's ted harrison's own unique way of uh painting right so now we're going to start getting into some details so uh let's take some of this cool yellow and i'm going to mix a bit of uh white into it the white's going to make it a little bit more opaque oops I don't think that was on screen here, right? So here's some of my uh, cool yellow. I put some white into it. And really there's only a little bit of a place for it. Now I'm gonna put this here. Later on, after that dries, I can put some uh, of that same cold yellow over top and it'll really pop because I'm painting over top of that, the white, right? Now let's do the same sort of thing here. Let's take a bit of the blue. Sorry, there was uh, some cold blue. I'm gonna mix this in here. And I know these colors aren't exactly right because I'm going to paint them again. But if you wanted to do it quote unquote right, this is basically just um, cold blue and cold yellow together. Most, almost entirely cold yellow. Okay. Now let's, this fellow's got, I think, just a, a warm red jacket. I'm also going to put a little bit of the white on here. So what this is going to look like is a little bit of a pastel kind of quality here. And then when I put the actual final colors over top, it will sing. Okay. And then the pants are kind of this purple. Let's just take this purple right out of the that we, we did for the mountains right here. I'm just gonna take that, put them on his legs. <laughs> I didn't quite get, uh, this is a pretty small little detail, right? Like it was the size of my fingernail. So I'm not gonna be able to get all that beautiful detail in there. Oh, I just noticed his hat was also red too, right? You know, by the time I outline all of this, I'm just going to put this color underneath here. I am not going to be able to... In fact, well, it's... it's this is, I guess, kind of like a warm orange. Maybe I'll, I'll just put a little bit of white into my warm yellow and paint over top of that. So this is warm yellow with some white. Let me just put that on her face too. Okay. Oh, and his hand. So very, very tiny little details. Okay. Let's let's look at it for one more second as we zoom back out. So we, we basically we did this once, and by doing it once, I think we learned a, f a few things, or at least I learned a few things. Um, or what, what that first 
layer of paint again we would call this our underpainting this would if you were if you wanted to switch now to oil paints this would be a great place to do it because we've got all of the colors in place uh, this is our finished underpainting if you're happy with it right now then you could just add the outlines with some white and it looks like pink and blue and then you'd be done I want to get I'm not quite satisfied with these colors they're still a little bit streaky and a little bit uh, transparent I want them to have more of that bold solidity that, that he's known for so I'm just gonna paint over top of them and I can now make some decisions I could say well you know what I liked this gray that I did in the sky but I think it needs to be a little bit more purpley like his so I can just mix it again and just add a little bit of the purple that I had on there or conversely I already mixed a purple I can just add white to that purple paint it over top and I'd be very happy um, I feel like I got that pretty good that color that's pretty good this orange I think I got that could pretty good where did I th do I notice maybe I could do a little bit different I like that color I think it's good that one could use maybe a little bit more white that could use a little more blue and that one's pretty much bang on um, in my my son it looks like I did, did a pretty good job with the colors I think the bottom one could be just almost like more magenta with just a little bit of white in there and then we can kind of also shape it a little bit more so I think what I'm gonna do now actually I'm gonna paint let's so so now so I hope hopefully that helps you understand uh, the, the the steps that I'm gonna do next so I think if I just kind of break down in my mind what I want to do next I'm gonna paint this kind of peachy orange first then I'm gonna paint the 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 kind of purple strips in the sky I'm gonna change that color a little bit I'm gonna do the Sun then this let's see the the this yellow and these mountains and then I'll finish off with the figures in the in the front so that's gonna take me probably another 30 minutes or so to do 40 minutes which I know is is takes longer to do but it's gonna create much better results so you know if this was a painting we were doing at the very beginning of my intro to painting class we would be probably almost we'd be almost wrapped up right but because I'm I want to get a little bit closer to the original I'm gonna just put in that extra little bit of work okay so let's do this the sky again so that sky was a cool red and cool yellow plus some white which I need to get some more white on here And I think you'll see when the second coat of paint goes on, it just has like a, a solidity that the first layer kind of lacked. One of the things a lot of people will do to get that solidity is they'll just add more white into their paint which is great because white is is a really solid opaque color or at least titanium white is we haven't really talked about the fact that there's many different kinds of white but the most common white that you can buy at your art supply store is titanium white it's a great color for covering up mistakes or uh, making an existing color more opaque that's beautiful and I, I would bet you so so the re so you could put more white in it just the thing is is it's gonna be more white it's gonna you're tinting the color that much more versus doing the same color and just painting it over there twice 
is going to keep it at the value level that it was Also, the second layer of paint, generally, you can put on a little bit faster. You can be a little bit less sort of cautious. You can use it to clean things up. I love doing doing it. It just it really makes a huge difference as far as I'm concerned. Okay. So previously, what we did is we mixed a gray to get up there. Remember, we used... Uh, warm red and cool blue we mixed it into this dark color and then we added white here we could do the same thing but since we made a purple I think we can just use this same color here and um, so let's just see I think this will look a little bit nicer it'll look a little bit closer to the original. It needs to be almost a little bit darker, just a little bit more purple. Ted Harrison is also well known for making these, for making prints. As I mentioned, um, in my parents' house growing up, we had a couple of Ted Harrison prints on the wall. And a lot of families have Ted Harrison prints, or postcards, all sorts of things that him, that he made. And that was a, a great way for him to to reach a much broader audience of people that, you know, probably can't afford to buy a $10,000 original painting, but could afford to spend a couple hundred dollars and get, you know, a limited edition print. And I, I don't know what method, I was watching a video, he talks about serographs. I don't know if that was how he made all of his prints or some of them were lithographs, etc. Because there's lots of different methods that artists use for printing, making multiples. That's good. Again, now that's a little bit <laughs> dark, but I don't mind that so much. It, what really, I think I should have put a little bit more pink into that color. A little bit more magenta in there. But let's just move forward here. I'm just going to take that color add a lot more white to it Again, you can see that I'm painting a little bit over that sun. I want to make sure that when I paint that sun that there's really no gaps between it and the area around it, so that's why I'm painting right up to it. Okay, and then lastly, mostly white.
Yeah, so I'm, I, I'm, part of me wants to go back and add more magenta into that top layer, but I don't know. We'll see if, if by the end of the painting I want to do that, I can do that. I think I'm just going to, for now, move on. <clears throat> I'll let that dry. While that's drying, let's go down here. I mean, I could blow dry it, but rather than just blow drying it, it'll dry on its own if I just move on to another part of the painting. So let's just do that. We've got our orange here, which is warm red and warm yellow. Okay. See, he's got a little bit more red in there. So let's put just a bit more red. This color is also going to change a little bit when you put some white on top of it. So we'll just have to. I think you'll see that happen. Outlining is usually just creates such a beautiful look, so. You know, I was thinking today that I don't even really, um, like the look, like Ted Harrison's artwork is so closely associated with the Yukon and, um, that I don't even really know if I can separate them in my mind. I'm so used to, like, when I think of the Yukon and the Arctic, I my mind almost defaults to Ted Harrison. He has he has had such a profound effect on, you know, I, I, I mean, I can only speak for myself, but I think probably a lot of other Canadians would agree, whether they even know it or not. Like, they might not even know who Ted Harrison is, but they've certainly seen his his work, either in, like, friends' houses growing up, or um, coffee shops, and murals, and postcards, and all that kind of stuff. And his art has also been ripped off many, many times by different people. Um, so... Anyway, so here's my cool blue. There's a little bit more white in it this time, not necessarily by purpose. Hmm. As I did the, doing this, I realized I didn't do the yellow in the background first. I can always do that next. As I said, there's no right or wrong way to do any of this. I don't know if the yellow in the background, if I need to do that. Obviously, we painted yellow, that warm yellow, as a, our first layer anyway, right? So, I don't think it's going to change too much, even with another layer of paint, so... That there. This blue, I think, is also going to be. We can use it for outlining things later on. Um, let's. I'm going to take a bit of um, cold red and just mix this into the same color. How, how this results. I think that's pretty good. Let me just zoom in here.
maybe I'll zoom in on here so you can see. Yeah, it's close. Actually, you know, pretty darn close. I'm pretty happy. So this color is, uh, which is the one I'm, I just mixed. Oh, it is a little bit darker. <laughs> it looks a little bit like the this one here on camera. This is so funny. The colors look so different on two different monitors. So in, when that's the case, you got to make sure you're painting it to look good for your eyes where you are. And you know, the painting might look great in your kitchen. You move it to your bedroom and you got different lighting in your bedroom and you're like, whoa, how come this painting looks so awful here? Right? The lighting is a big part of color and therefore how we perceive paintings. You know, more and more these days, art gallery museums uh, light their paintings with natural light, but even then have like screens that are diffusing the light and possibly even modifying or coloring the light. So we often, are seeing paintings, you know, they can, and if it's, especially if it's natural light, you know, the light we all know can, can look different at nine in the morning than it does at noon, than it does at five, than it does at 10 at night, right? And if you're relying on natural light to light those paintings, that same painting can look more blue or orange as the day progresses. Okay, so let's do keep on moving downhill here. Coming towards us, I guess. So we've got this purple. I think we're gonna mix a bit of it again. Let's take some warm blue, cool red. Mix that up. Get some white on here. Let's put it I mean my hope is is that as you look at it you're like wow it does look better after a second coat of paint some people are probably like yeah I don't know I would have been fine I could have moved on You know, it, it all depends on what your goals for making a painting are. There's some people whose goals for making a painting are to make a painting that makes a ton of money and makes them rich. Some other people are making paintings just for the pure pleasure of it. And if it's just for the pure pleasure of it, then speed shouldn't really be an issue, right? Think about if we go back to you know one of the artists that we looked at, Yayoi Kasuma, the Japanese artist, who deliberately paints in the most slow and time-consuming process. How did I get that there? What did I just do that when I was flailing my hand? Oh no, I tested the color. That's right. I was like, Yayoi Kasuma paints in, in a deliberately slow process because she uses the painting as a um, therapeutic activity, right? So the last thing she wants to do is make the painting as quickly as possible because it's the very thing that, uh, you know, slows the voices in her head, right? So, you know, she might be one of those persons who might do three or four coats of paint on there because she just wants to can you know or she's got another painting on the go she doesn't want to stop
So for every person out there who's like impatient, you know, and I, I would count myself as a pretty impatient person, despite maybe how it looks sometimes. Um, I always, it's sort of a, I weigh my desire to get the painting finished as quickly as possible with my desire to make it look as good as possible. And painting on something for a long time does not in and of itself make for a good painting. Right there, I, I know from experience that I remember distinctly uh, when I've been painting like series of paintings, you know, for a museum or whatever, and I've got to make 20 paintings or so, there's been times where, you know, the painting that, there's a painting that I labor over for weeks and it's just not working, or it finally is okay, and then there's a painting that I do in two hours that is just like, you know, it's some kind of the planets align and it just comes out looking like gold. And you're just like, oh my goodness, how come they, how can this one have come out so easily where the other ones are like pulling teeth and wrestling with it? And, you know, that's just the mystery of making art. You hear about stories of musicians, I don't know, like the Rolling Stones or something, and they like, you know, Tell us the story behind this song. Like, ah, I don't know, I was uh, waiting, there, they were recording something, and I was just sitting outside smoking a cigarette, and um, I heard the pizza delivery man say, oh, you gotta have sympathy for the devil, you know, these days, or, uh, I was like, oh, that's a great, I started writing and strumming a guitar, Tw 20 minutes later, I ran into the studio, guys, let's start recording, I got the song, boom. I don't know if that's how Sympathy for the Devil <laughs> or the story behind that Rolling Stones song came about, but there's many examples similar to that where, you know, some songs, and then that's the song that becomes the huge hit, and they're just like, how, like, you know, here I am working day and night to, to get something, and then the one song that is, is just a toss-off, a filler on, this, on the rest of the album, that's the one that whenever we play the stadium show that people are yelling out <laughs> they're like how about the one that I worked so hard on how come no one wants to hear that song okay so let's do the uh, foreground again let's take some white and the warm blue Just cleaning that up a little bit. Now let's go to... Maybe I'll let that dry. Let's do the sun up top now. Maybe I, I'll actually... I'm going to blow dry all this because I got wet paint in many different areas of the picture. And let's just maybe look at them side by side too. It's probably worth just taking a second. So we've got mostly the colors are pretty good. That color could probably have used a little bit more blue. And this could have used maybe a little bit more magenta to make it a little bit more purple as opposed to gray. But, uh, you know, sm I mean, depending on how you think of it, it could be smaller, big details. I don't know. So, <clears throat> again, I'm going to blow dry all this. I'm going to mute the microphone.
So let's, uh, we're going to paint the sun and the figures and then some outlining and this painting will be done, I suspect, in 25 minutes and then we'll move on to the other painting if you're keeping track. <laughs> okay, so, um, let's start with our cool magenta. And roll my sleeve up here. In fact, let's zoom in, sorry. So technically, these lines should obviously in be intersecting with the, the uh, sun going right through. I think there probably could have been a little bit more white in there, but... Uh Need some more white on my palette. sharp of a change here so let's adding more magenta Ah, I'm not super happy with all of that just yet. Okay, let's just go up to the next level. White. Okay. 
So, as I'm looking at this, like the, I see a few things that could be fixed. If I should want to fix them. Let's just finish that little bit of friend fella off on there. So, you'd see this shape of the sun is a little bit goofy, right? Not quite... Um, the shape that I would particularly like. So, ideally these lines would be kind of going right through in a really nice fluid way. And they're not really doing that. So... Let's see if I can touch that up. Part of this, I think, comes down to the, that uh, first layer. My, my initial drawing was a bit wacky. Remember you saw all those little circles that I drew? I was, wasn't quite sure exactly what I wanted to do there. So a bit, it's a bit misshapen. So we can kind of try to bring a bit more uh, the, this shape in here as we touch it up. Not quite as gorgeous as his. Um, but we're also looking at it pretty close. I think if we zoom back out, it'll we'll feel a little bit better about it. <laughs> it's a good, little bit of a misshapen... It is a... You are sort of... If I really start playing around with, like, that circle, it is possible that I'll throw it way out of whack. Um, okay. So, uh, what should I do next? I think I'm going to paint these figures in here. Let's get these colors the way I want them. And then um, we'll outline everything. So let's... Oops. And obviously the outlining process, you could end up spending quite a while doing this um, to get it to the point that you're ha most happy with. Get these purple pants in. Yeah. 
Now he's outlined everything here. His, the original painting is much larger than mine. I don't even think I'm going to outline the figure. Maybe, or maybe just use a little bit of black in a few places, but... Good. The we're gonna use some cool yellow. So here's my cool yellow. See, I'm just noticing it's curved a bit there. And then some green, cool green. This, I'm just going to use the same orange we used for the the back hill. Okay. So let's just take a look at everything at this point again. Okay, some more comments there in the chat. I see Eleanor says, the only painting I can remember in my home when I was growing up was a green ship painted on black velvet that was in the living room, and it was as long as the couch. Wow, that's a big painting. <laughs> Assuming it was a big couch, right? That's cool. That might be fun to try to make a version of that painting now, um, and just see what, you know, you could make it a, a better version. Like, I wish it always had a pirate flag on it or something, right? You could add that into the painting. <laughs> I see Jazz says, hello. Jazz says, your purple needs a touch of, uh, of uh, magenta. Quinacridone magenta. Yeah, I could put a bit of that in there. Again, my goal is not necessarily to get all of the colors perfect. It's to try to... I, I'm more or less interested in just showing people how to mix a little bit of color um, but I'm not obsessed with making it quote unquote perfect or making exact reproductions of any of these paintings uh, Jess says what's your cool yellow handsome medium or cadmium yellow light I think it's a handsome uh, well this here Amsterdam yellow just says primary yellow in the very first uh, intro to painting class, I, or it's like episode zero, I did a buyer's guide, and you can find in there, like, I, I, I showed, I think, ten different brands of acrylic paint, and the exact, uh, you know, like the six colors that I would get, that I recommend you get, if you want to use whatever brand of paint, whether it's golden, or these Amsterdam paints, uh, the Rembrandt, the... Derwent, the Buzz, you know, there's uh, Opus brand. I mean, there's so many different kinds of brands of paint that you can use. Anyway, uh, I'm going to, let's move on to painting some white in the, the outlines here. So... Or should I do this? I'm going to scoop up this white and put it a little bit to the side here. And 
I'm going to use a bit of, um, I'm just going to put a little bit of glazing fluid. You could use slow dry medium. I just find slow dry medium slows the painting down a little bit, the, the drying time down a bit too much. And I'm just using this to give it a little bit more fluidity to the paint. You could also use, there's, Golden makes like 15 different mediums you can use to add to your paint. Like GAC 100, 200, 300, 400, 600, you know, and so on. And each of them are slightly different formulations. Uh, I have almost all of them in behind here. But of course, my goal is not to just tell you to go out and buy 20 different types of additives you can add to your paint. I want you to try to be able to do as much of these paintings with the few different things that we've been using throughout this entire course, right? The one caveat with adding any medium to the paint is generally it's going to to not only make, make it maybe more fluid, make, which makes it easier to paint, but it can also make it more transparent, which means you might end up having to do two coats of that same color, which can be a little frustrating, right? So let's just, uh, let's paint up here. Actually, let's go to a slightly different view. So this is an opportunity, if you want, to um, maybe be a little bit more expressive with this line and add, you know, like a little bit of uh, bumps and things to this background. Like if we look at this here, just zoom in. You know, it's not just, you know, he's sort of going up and down, giving a little bit A little bit more descriptive about this background space. So you can see that even though it goes on nice and clean, and it is slightly more transparent. Now you can see his is also a little bit transparent too. So he and um I should also mention Ted Harrison painted most of his paintings with acrylic. So unlike some men, I would say most of the artists we've looked at just historically have been painting with oil paints just because for a long time that was the only kind of paint that was available to artists because acrylic paint has only really been around since the 1930s and commercially available kind of in the early 1960s so it wasn't like it was a paint that you could buy you know uh, commonly like you can today now oil paint is much more rare to find than acrylic paint uh, jazz asks uh, opus brand are you Canadian yes I am Canadian I'm uh, was born in Calgary and I'm coming to you live from Vancouver, British Columbia. Whereabouts are you, Jazz? Opus is a uh, is one of the biggest art supply stores in Canada. For those of you outside of Canada wondering what we're talking about, in the United States, I think what would be the biggest would be maybe uh, is it Dick Blick? 
or uh, what's what's another one? Um, well, Hobby Lobby. Jazz, it says, um, fantastic, I'm in Toronto, but used to live in Victoria. So do you go to the art supply store underneath the Ontario College of Art there, or the, what's it called? Now it's going to drive me crazy. What's the name of that art supply store? Every time I'm in Toronto, I usually go there. Um, okay, so we're going to mix some pink. That pink... Uh, looks like it is the same pink as our sun, so that's magenta. And I, actually, I'm just gonna take since I've, I'm just gonna take some of this pink and just transfer it over here, since I've got this kind of mixture ready to go. Just for reference here, above ground art. That's right. <laughs> that's the art supply store in Toronto, right underneath the uh, OCAD there. So you can see the reason why this color is a little bit transparent is because of that glazing fluid. I think I must have just put a bit too much in there. Which means, you know, if I really want to clean it up, I might have to do a second coat of that. I don't think I'm going to do that for today. I think I'm going to be pretty happy with this by the end. We'll, we'll see. I've, you know famous last words um. Yeah, he's definitely... In fact, I can see a few places where he has done a couple of layers. So I, th I bet you ten bucks this is the way, what basically what he did. Is sort of laying down a, uh, a, maybe a bit of a lighter line and then going back over it a second time. You just want to be careful like of getting too many peaks high points where the paint is really kind of um, quite pronounced. We have a lot of that impasto texture almost. I find that makes life a little bit difficult if you're going to go over top of those lines later. Yeah, that above ground art supply in Toronto is great, although I can't imagine that place, you know, you know social distance, distancing in that place would be really tricky. It is like the most narrow art supply store in the world. The minute you walk in there, you're all, you're like on top of other people going up and down those narrow stairs and obviously they probably just had huge lines outside or he probably had like a table set up out front where people could just buy 
I don't know. It's always it's interesting to think of like how people nav different places, businesses navigated this whole pandemic, right? So I think what I'll do is I'll finish this outlining and set it aside. I'll work on the other one, let all this dry, and then I'll paint the other one. And then if I decide I want to put the extra 15 minutes into to kind of clean up these lines to get more of an electric pink on here, then I'll do it at that time. But we'll see. Um, But basically putting in this color, a little bit of that white in there just is going to make any color over top of it a little bit brighter and easier to see. So let's do the same sort of thing with our cool blue and white. Okay. I just I one of the reasons why I love the work of this artist so much beyond the fact that I, I was surrounded by a few of these images when I was a kid growing up is his sort of commitment to a style. You know, there's some artists that are famous for switching up their style um, over and over and over again. Picasso probably being the most famous, obviously. But there's other examples of, of artists that began one way changed radically. We looked at Philip Guston a few weeks ago. He's an, an example of an artist who quite radically switched things up twice in his life to uh, to the disgust of, of some people and the mostly to the shock of everyone but I think once people understood what he was up to people really liked it. Um, we're going to look at an artist next week, Dorothy Mark. I always say Markowski because that's my grandmother's name, or was her name when she before she passed a few years ago. But um, Doris McCarthy. We're going to paint uh, a couple paintings by her next week, and I'll show you some images that show kind of how she changed her style multiple times from the 1930s, 40s, 50s, 60s. She's really inspiring because she painted all the way up until her death at age 100. So if there's anybody out there who says, ah, it's too late to get started, Doris Mark, Mark <laughs> Doris 
McCarthy is an example of someone who was painting all the way up until the end. She's she's a huge, and then of course we're going to be painting a um, Grandma Moses painting at the beginning of September. Grandma Moses is particularly famous for not even beginning to make art until she was, I think, 82 around there. So she barely even picked up a paintbrush at any point in her life until that age, right? So. There's many examples of great late bloomers out there. That paint looks like it's kind of dead, so let's just mix it again. I'm going to take our cool blue and warm red. We're going to mix this really dark color. And I'm going to just add a little bit of blue, warm, or turn it into a bit of a warm blue. I'm going to use this for the figures in the bottom down here. Way too much paint on my brush. Let's look at the original. Now, when we look at this, I am not going to go for all of that detail. because it's just a recipe for great frustration. But um, so happy with how wide those outlines got but Hmm. Yeah, I don't mind. I mean, obviously, I would have liked them to be much thinner, but I kind of got a little bit lazy. Okay, so that's pretty good. So I'm going to put this one aside, I'm going to let it dry, and then I think I'll probably, you know me, I'm going to, I can't walk away from a painting, I'm probably going to do those bit, that pink later on, but I'll let it dry nicely first, and um, that's going to, well, can I, mm, I'm going to want to do something there, aren't I? So because I'm going to want to do something there, I might as well just prep it by going back over let's 
just going to paint that white. And I'll be able to paint some yellow and green in its place. Okay, so let's set that aside. And then this one should go go much faster because it's a little bit simpler of a painting, but we'll see, right? Famous last words again, right? So, So for this painting, um, I'm gonna I'm gonna go a little bit faster. We're, we're gonna paint. This is definitely a you know like we talked about our warm and cool colors right off the bat, and how he's sort of maybe not using them necessarily as as the way that we, you know that we've talked about in the past. But that doesn't mean that we can you know we can force it. And we can change the colors to, so that they're more truer to the system that we've been talking about. So that we have our warm colors in the foreground and the cool colors in the background. Or we can just try to replicate a version of what he's done. I think just for the sake of simplicity, I'll probably do a little bit more of the, the latter. Just um, So where should we start here? Maybe I'm gonna take I'm gonna take this cool blue. I'm gonna I'm gonna put a, a bit of a cool blue with some white in the background, and then we can always paint it cool blue or the warm blue that he's that he used. Um, that way, it's got something cool there to help push it backwards. So I'm gonna, I'll paint this um, sun white completely. So I'm not even worried about that shape at all. If anything, I just wanna get rid of any little ridges in here. Okay. Let me see, what can we do? Maybe we'll take this same color and paint it right in the belly. So our cool blue uh, with a little bit more white. And as I say all the time, don't worry about perfection at this stage. We just want to throw as much color onto the painting as possible and sometimes you know you can even use this as an opportunity to put the wrong colors in and see what kind of effects how that looks Jazz in the chat says Dorsmer 
<laughs> Doris McCarthy made some great paintings. Absolutely. Yeah, Google her. You'll be blown away. And I'm, so I'm so excited to make paintings of hers. And uh, at this, this time next week. Or, yeah, this time next week. Okay. This here is, we're going to make that purple. So let's take some warm blue and cool red and mix it together. Take some white. White is going to help us see that color. Now I'm going to modify this color anyway, so I'm just going to put it in just like this. I'm not even going to bother trying to get it right. I just want to get something in here, and then you know maybe you paint purple in like this, and you go, "Hey, actually that's kind of cool. I like that." Let's do this. Let's add a little more blue to it. That same color. A little bit more white. Looking at now, I see that it's a lot more complicated than that. So let's just add some of these bumps and things. Let's get that orange in next. Oh, I think I just got a bunch of paint on my face, so. <laughs> Where is that? Often when I finish these sessions, I come upstairs and my wife is like, you got paint all over your face. Um, so, <laughs> let's keep on going here. Um, let's add, mix a orange. Now I put, this is orange, but I put some white into that orange, which turns it into a much more of a peachy color. I'm just doing that just because it's going to make it easier when I put the actual orange generally is one of the most transparent colors or at least with the the paints that I'm using right here so in order to just help this process adding a little bit of white will give it a little bit more opacity Okay. 
And then the pink. Let's do... Let me just take this cold pink here. It's got lots of... You know, there's paint here that's got blues and all sorts of other colors on it. That doesn't bother me so much. Um, because we're just going to put this color down and paint over top of it later on. So... I just painted out the legs of that bird because I'll do that later on. I'm not gonna. It would be. It's not worth my time to sit here and do all that outlining. It just was. It's not. Uh, it will take too long. I won't do a very good job of it. It won't look very good. So this is not only faster, but it's going to yield a better result. We got everything in place pretty well. Actually, you know, while we're right here, since I'm going to paint that red, I'm just going to take the white that I have on here. <laughs> I should be doing using doing a smaller brush to do this. Well, his is a little bit bigger, isn't it? So let's, and like, we'll just enlarge this. Has anyone ever been to the Yukon or Alaska, Northwest Territories, Nunavut, anywhere really far north, Greenland? Has anyone ever seen the sun, the midnight sun? Has anyone ever seen the sun up after midnight? If you've uh, ever been, you know, it, quite far north, you know exactly what I'm talking about, that there are times where the sun stays up for weeks, right? And you have to have shutters on your windows to block out the sun so that you can get a, a little bit of sleep. Uh, Joshua says, I totally agree Doris Mac McCarthy's uh, makes really good paintings. I saw her artwork when I was looking at the Dropbox for tracings of her work. Yes, there's some great art in there that we're going to be doing. And Jazz says, I've been to the Northwest Territories. I think I've, I might have been to almost every province or territory in Canada, except the Northwest Territories. I've been to Nunavut, Yukon, Maybe I, I don't know if I... I don't think I've been to Newfoundland and Labrador. That would be the only... Newfoundland and Labrador and Northwest Territories. Otherwise, I've been everywhere else. And just as a little pro... Uh, 
uh, Canada travel. This is a great time to do some traveling within Canada or for that matter around the United States or wherever you are on Earth because so many of the borders are closed right now. So places where there's usually tons of tourists are not only desperate for visitors, but there, the, there's it's you can go to the front of the line of a lot of places, museums, etc. Okay. So right now, we've got the basics of everything painted in here. Now some of the colors aren't quote unquote the right colors. That's okay because we're going to put in uh, colors over top of this. This is we're just getting the basics in place, our, our our primary layer or what is known as your underpainting, right? So we've got our underpainting. Underpainting, you want to try to do that as quickly as possible within somewhere between. 20 minutes to an hour depending on how complicated the image is that took us what maybe 15 20 minutes um, so we didn't overthink the colors we just sort of put them in there I'm gonna blow dry this actually maybe right before I do that it's gonna take some white let's paint these cat's eyes in here quickly Now I can do that. So, oh yeah, let's. We're, I was gonna blow dry this first, right? Give me one second to do that. Let's see, let's, that, the, the sky, the background, the sky in the background, that is definitely a warmer blue, but it's, it's a, there's a bit of white, maybe even a bit of the cold blue in here. So I think I need to get a bit of each and we'll mix it together. since I'm going to use a few different colors here and put a bunch of that on the palette so I don't have to do too much dipping. Okay, so let's take, we got our warm blue. Let's just mix this right here. Warm blue, take a bit of cold blue. And that's going to sort of position it a little bit between those colors. And it's going to take a little bit of the intensity out of that nice um, warm blue and make it a little bit um, it just dulls it down just ever so slightly.
Okay, I might do another subsequent layer of this after that dries, just so I can get a really nice color in there. But the and so you can see the reason why I put that cold blue underneath is it's it's cooling down that really warm blue, especially because it's in the background there. Let's move on to this area. It's pretty much the same thing, but let's add some white in here. That's a lot of white. I'm going to take a bit of that gray that we had here. It's just going to start dulling that color down. Let's take a bit of the cold blue. Pretty darn close there. Let's just go right up to here. I know there's a line in between there, but... Maybe I won't have to do the line, or I don't know. We'll see. Okay. <laughs> I see Gail in the chat says, I totally want to use my acrylic pens to outline. Is that cheating? LOL. Absolutely not. If you got them, use them. I think it's uh, uh, totally open your call. I think you should feel, you know, um, free to use whatever materials you have to do whatever uh, you want to to do. Artists will will and do use every available material to express themselves. Sometimes people get all up in this sort of moral implication, so sort of like, oh, it's cheating when you use an outline to get the composition down. It's cheating when you, you know, it's cheating if you use green, a green tube of paint rather than mixing the green yourself. I, at, at no point, I hope I haven't. Uh, um, I, sh I sh maybe should emphasize that I, I have nothing against people using green or brown tubes of paint. If, if it helps, you should use it. I do think that it is, especially if you're learning to paint, very helpful to learn how to do all of this stuff on a, on a, on a, uh, using the basic paints that we have I think also just for consistency purposes you're gonna get better results I think if you're mixing the color yourself so it's not just right out of the tube but hey what am I who am I I'm not gonna stop anybody from doing it but uh, I'm not there's nothing inherently wrong with it it's just it's just not my method my preferred way of painting personally but you know I use the example many times of of I mean it's funny that like artists get all up in these moral quandaries about if it's okay to do this or that where you never hear your, uh, like I had shoulder surgery after I got hit by, I was riding my bicycle, got hit by a car um, a couple of years ago. And, you know, I would never, if my surgeon had said, hey, listen, 
I want to do some, the way that I want to do your surgery is I want to use the same surgery techniques they used during the American Civil War. So there's going to be no anesthetic. Uh, we're not going to use x-rays or anything. Uh, I've got like a hand saw and a pocket knife. What do you think? I'd be like, uh, uh, I need a second opinion. So there's no, if I, if, a, if your surgeon ever said that, you'd, you'd be like, are you insane? But when it comes to painting, people are like, you know what? I want to use the exact methods that were used 400 years ago. I'm not going to use a video projector. I'm not going to use a photocopier. I'm not going to use an iPad. I'm not going to use any tools, technology that could help me get a better composition. Um... I'm going to grind my own pigments, I'm going to stretch my own canvas, and so on and so forth. Um, personally, I, I, I've never understood that approach. I think it's interesting to, to do a little bit of it and to understand uh, what's involved, but um, to... Uh, to pass judgment on other people who don't use that uh, is seems absurd and you and it is like you, I hear that that same sort of those those questions from students all the time um, those are powerful myths so much so that people don't even realize that that artists even 500 years ago used various different technologies to help them. That these so-called, you know, masters like Leonardo and Michelangelo, they all quote-unquote cheated all the time. So... And that's one reason why a lot of artists are very secretive about their process because they cheat all the time and because people have such hang-ups over it they don't want to to let anybody know because they're afraid of the negative reaction that they might receive. It's so funny. When I was in art school I used to use a video projector or acetate projector to project images and then I'd trace them out and then I'd paint them on there and people would try to like scandalize me by he's cheating and I'd be like you obviously don't know anything about art history do you? <laughs> like uh, if Leonardo or Michelangelo if Michelangelo was alive today he would have used a, vi uh, a projector to project those images onto the Sistine Chapel. I guarantee you 100%. Um, Michelangelo used what was called cartoons, which are giant pieces of paper with the little tiny holes over it and the pounding chalk dust onto the, or charcoal dust onto the ceiling. You peel it off and you see a whole bunch of little dots and that would let you know where the figure is. You imagine doing that if you've ever been to the Sistine Chapel and you see how high that is. Like, uh, he might have, I don't know if he even had assistance helping him do any of that. And if someone had said to him, like, hey, Michael, we got a, we got a, a method that will, that will shave off a few months worth of backbreaking labor on the top of a rickety scaffold, what do you think? He'd be like, I can't get it. Bring it to me now. I don't care. <laughs> uh, but don't, aren't you worried that people are going to say that you're a fraud? I don't care. <laughs> I'm a sculptor. I don't even know why I'm making this painting anyway. The Pope's, I think, got something against me. So that's a whole other conversation. It's really interesting. You can read all of Michelangelo's letters back and forth with the Pope. Um, about the painting of the Sistine Chapel, arguing over money and all that kind of stuff. And Michelangelo was a sculptor. He was a famous sculptor. And yet the Pope wanted him to paint the ceiling. And some people speculated that it was... There was... Um, uh, 
it was done sort of uh, as a, a bit of a punishment. I mean, I love I love reading about art history and and all the bizarre things that have happened. It's amazing to see like how many of oh, those records from the past still exist. Just like when we were talking about the letters that Van Gogh wrote to his brother, which you can read. So I, I honestly, I haven't even looked at the original. I don't even know how close. Ah, okay. These colors are pretty good. I was gonna say, I, I, for all I know, these colors were, are totally wrong. But uh, I guess, I guess I was pretty close the first time. So that's good. Now we see like these colors are getting nice and solid. There is a few little, it's more um, painterly up here. And so the question I have to myself is, do I want to keep that or do another coat over to really um, resolve it? I don't know. We'll see. We will see. I think when we get a little bit further along here, you know, I, I suspect we're probably about. 40 minutes or less from finishing this particular painting off because really what we have to do is just get a few more color of these solid this solid color that blue one again and then we're into the outline so it just depends on how long I actually want to spend outlining things <laughs> um, okay so this cat let's take our cool blue and a bit more white And I know some people are like, well, now like this, the cat, you know, all of the guidelines have disappeared. This is going to be really tricky to paint all those guidelines without the help. Well, you know, I was just saying that artists will use whatever technology or tools to help them. You don't want to become overly reliant on those things. They are helpful and take advantage of them whenever possible. But you should also learn to be able to, you should be able to do most of what we're doing without that assistance, right? So you've, you, we have the basic shapes in place, right? Now it's like, how can I, um, we, yeah, it's like, I know where these legs are. It's, it's, it might take me a little bit more time to, to do it, but. Pretty, pretty happy with the way this looks so far. Okay, I'm gonna put. Uh, so I'm just gonna take this warm blue right off out of the tube, and I'm just gonna paint it right up top here. This warm blue is very transparent. You could see. Like if we really wanted a solid blue, we might have to do this layer like three or four times, which I'm not going to do.
a little bit patchy here. And as the paint is drying, it's getting a little bit sticky, which further complicates the problem. So I think that's pretty good, though. Especially when we put the outlines and everything on there, I think it's going to be better. But we can also, I can touch that up to, I'm sure I'll probably drop something on the painting surface and that will change it too, so... Part of me feels like I want to change this so that these two are a little bit more different. Either adding more white. It might make more... Hmm. I do feel compelled to maybe make that more white, the cat, but maybe this should be changed. What if we turn that into a purple? A little bit more purpley? I might do that. Let's just make, let's make a bit of a purple color here. That's totally unlike the original. This is just, this is my painting, right? I get to make some choices. And if you want to turn this into a green stripe or a purple stripe or whatever color you like, you have my permission to do so. Now, will it, will this have been a good choice? Uh, we'll see. I don't know. Just needed to be different. That's, I had to make some decision because I didn't like that there were, that, that was too, so close together. Okay. So, now we're, we're just into the outlining phase. So I'm going to blow dry all of this. And then, uh, yeah, so it's, it's however long you want to spend doing the outlining. I'm going to go relatively quick. I want to try to finish this in maybe 25 minutes at most. So let's mute this. I should also say that what we're painting today, the original is a print, right? I couldn't find the painted version of them. I saw in an interview that he gave 
that he said that he made um, uh, new original artwork for the prints rather than making necessarily uh, prints based on the paintings, so I, he may never, there may not actually be an original painted version of this. I just liked this image so much, I thought it would be kind of cool, and I know there's a lot of people who love cats out there, and birds, so that's why I chose this particular image. So, wonder where we should start. I am... Thinking, what if we add some more white to that purple? Jazz says, the crow is going to peck that cat's bum. Yeah, I do think that's... The cat seems relatively um, at peace with that, though. <laughs> Doesn't seem to be uh, all that concerned about a like, bird just about to peck him in the butt. I would think that would be kind of painful, but... This cat just seems to be rolling with it. this I, I was gonna try to f do this purple with just the scraps left on the canvas but I'm gonna make a bigger batch here this will make my life a lot easier sometimes you know at the end of the painting sometimes I just get a little bit impatient and I'm using the very last little dredges of paint left over and sometimes it works but sometimes it the, those last little dredges of paint are, are thick and gummy and can just make the whole painting process like unpleasant, especially if you're doing outlines and everything. You're trying to paint with gummy paint. Ugh, just... So let's dive in. So all these little things... Those are... Oops. That's, uh, that was a piece of paint. Okay. Where did that come from? Ah! There's some water just dripped on here from above. Ugh. This is my ice pack. little okay I'm not sure if that affected the background or not we'll see it left there's a bunch of little I need to get some new rags out here because anyway never mind it's just my little thing let's look at So these outlines are, are pretty big and bold, so you don't have to worry so much about being too careful.
I'm just going to take that line and go right through the bird. That way I can be assured that I'm not going to have the line go here and then it pops up down there. It can be kind of relatively um, consistent. Okay. So, anywhere else this, I think, let's... Um, Taking this kind of warm blue, oops, so I just took some of this purple mixing in with my warmer blue, which is in this color, and So that kind of thing starts happening more and more towards the end of the painting where you got sometimes these little blobs of dried paint that start to make their way onto your brush. So if you're painting with acrylic paint, you, you want to sort of think about, um, you know, even change, like, you probably don't want to paint for more than about five hours at a time with acrylic paint. Uh, after that, you're going to start really running into paint that is just going to be seizing up constantly. Okay. Now, uh, for the outline uh, around the figure, or the cat, I mean, let's mix a dark blue. So we'll take this cold blue. Let's even take a bit of cold or warm uh, um, warm reds, right? Cold blue and warm red. Maybe a little bit more. Obviously, if we put a lot more warm red in there, we're going to get a very dark color. That's how we got this color. So, sorry. So we took cold blue, warm red, and mixed it together right here. And get this really kind of dark. I think there was a bit of white that was previously on the palette there as well. This is also just starting to seize up. So I'm just going to mix a bit of glazing fluid in there to thin it down a little bit, give it a bit more brushability. Okay, so let's start with the face of this cat.
So I start, I use the kind of the landmarks that I, that are still here to help guide me. these eyes and those ears oh ah I'm getting paint all over the bottom part of the canvas here right here you can see I'll have to clean that up afterwards do I actually do I have any of that paint still on the canvas Hmm. Just took a little bit of paint to try to sort that out. Okay. I also find like after painting for a few hours. I'm a pretty messy painter, which is why I like you see me cleaning up all the time, because <laughs> I have to make a big mess. Now, I'm not sure why he painted that ear like that. That is weird. Um, I don't know if I'm... Let's, in here. I think his paint was a little bit darker than mine. That's okay. We can always add, um, you can always darken it if you like. I think I'm, I'm fine. Now I'm going to put white in here uh, and then paint red in there afterwards. I'm just locating everything. So remember to join the Facebook group and upload your version 
of today's painting, if you're painting along with me, or if you're painting something else today, I would love to see what you've been working on. Because in a couple of weeks, I can't remember what day here in August it is, a couple of Sundays from now, we will gather to celebrate your artwork and what you've accomplished and the way that I get all those images is I just go on the Facebook group and pull them off I used to do say oh put it on my Instagram or Twitter and and it, it took me so long to find all those images and I'd forget some and people would be ah oh, it's on my Instagram Ah, oh, you told me to put it out. Uh, no, I was like, oh my goodness. So, just the Facebook group these days makes my life a lot easier, especially when there's literally hundreds of images. Not that I'm complaining, because I think that's so... It makes me so excited to see a community grow like that and have so many people who are participating with me, but... There's only so many hours in the day. Okay. So I'm starting to get all these paint boogers, as Jazz so eloquently put it. Forming here. Sometimes that's the dried paint on the palette. Oops. And then sometimes that's the... There's like paint these dry little pieces from my hand falling on onto the so I probably would benefit from washing my hands right now but I'm just gonna power through So obviously there's a little bit of pink that I missed here. We'll have to touch that up. That's why it's generally advisable to try to get rid of as much of that yellow as possible. See, I left the belly for last here. Because really, that line should connect here. So a few little things that I'll need to just do quick touches up on. So let's... Uh, this pink left. 
Okay. And then the blue on the body itself. Do I have any more of that kicking around? I gotta mix a bit more of it. Didn't like how that tail turned into a little point. Um, okay, so let's zoom out here. I hear my wife getting the bath ready for our daughter. So that means I gotta do some hustle. Um. So let's wash up some brushes. Now I just basically need to paint red for the sun, black for the birds, and the snow falling, which is like a pinkish color. Oh, still so many of you guys watching and painting along. Again, I can't wait to see what you guys produce. If you're painting a version of today's painting or something else entirely. That face is a little bit compressed. I'm not super happy about that, but um, it is what it is. I could just paint over it with some white, put some blue back in its place, but I'd probably have to paint most of the body again make it work. Remember, this is my second painting of the session, so I'm always sort of pushing my luck when I do two paintings in, uh, during one episode, but this is just some warm red. When in doubt, I'm going to paint over obscure all of the white I'm going to paint the, the, the snow uh, now. In fact, let's mix this paint. I'm not being too careful or picky with 
<laughs> the uh, the mixture there. And let's see. Well, you can see all those little tiny pieces of white powder that came off my fingers there. Let's zoom in. It's too big of a glob. You could put a secret message in here with some by putting the dots in a particular kind of arrangement. The trick is, uh, I'm, I'm trying to do here, is keep these dots uh, kind of random, which is really tricky. Trying Deliberately trying to make something random is not easy. I find the best way to do that is just to kind of move around and almost do it like unconsciously like you're just not really trying to th overthink it All right like those line up into the pack like that drives me crazy so So I'll put a bunch of these down and we'll zoom out and see how well we did and if we need to add a few more here. Ah, I got paint. Ah, this is always what happens towards the end of a painting. Some of these little bits and bobs start coming off. As I say, most accidents happen close to home, right? When you're when you're within sight of the end, you sort of take your mind off of things. You start thinking about what you're going to be doing for dinner and the Netflix show you're going to be watching and emails you got to write, and then it's like, oh my goodness, how did I manage to let that happen? <laughs> I don't know if you can hear our daughter running around up there. She's approaching her second birthday next week. Oh my goodness. And even though she's she's getting bigger, 
those footsteps definitely feel louder than they've ever been. Okay, so let's zoom back out. Just take a look. Sometimes what I find is you might start on one side, and by the time you get to the other side, the dots are closer together or further away. So sometimes it's a good idea just to take a, a look even halfway through the process to see if, uh, if it's kind of balanced. Okay, I'm also going to paint this same color into, oops, into the bow here so that I can paint red over top and it will really sparkle. Okay. Great. Yeah, I'm kind of bummed that that head should have come down a little bit lower here. That chin should probably be down here. That's okay. You know, you, you guys on your versions can extend that and do a better job than I did. get some warm red. Should probably wait for this, but let's just do it now. Yeah, it's still not dry. But you get the idea. Okay, so let's move into black. We haven't used black at all today. So we're going to use the black to get these birds that on our palette. We don't need a lot of black. But put about as much black on my palette as I put toothpaste on my toothbrush. I also really like saving, if I use black at any point in the painting, I'll only put it on the, the palette at the very end to ensure that it is as fresh as possible because 
Otherwise, it's just going to sit there and harden and and get less and less fluid, and then it's just a real pain to paint with. So. This is maybe one of the first times I've just been painting black on its own. Often I'll mix some another color into the black just to give it a bit more life, but I don't think that's what he did here, so I'm not going to do that. So I can't I don't I can't really see any lines here so I'm just doing my best to to paint in what I see Okay, let's go, let's go up to the top one here. Hmm, maybe it's hard to see what was here. I can see now that that background is too dark up top there, but that's okay. Okay. 
I might have to move that tail again. Now it's okay that this bird's um, wing is, you know, the, the background is dark. It doesn't have to be like super bright all the time. It is just maybe not quite fully in line with his style. I don't think he would like it to have, I think he'd, he wants more contrast generally. Okay, we'll move down to the one on the bottom here. And then I think we're done, unless I want to do, like, I mean, there's some little things I'm not happy with, but. As there all with, as there are with every painting, right? <laughs> this one just keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger as I'm trying to hide all the, the yellow on there. Okay, that kind of cracks me up. Okay, so let's see. Yeah, I'm happy with it. I can walk away from it. Again, there's these little tiny bits of white that are on there. Best thing is just to let the painting dry as long as possible before you start picking at it, because those little tiny bits will um, 
you, can, you risk accidentally smudging something. Now I'm just looking at these birds. I'm just going to take a bit of extra black. Remember I painted these birds with just my, a small brush. So particularly these big spaces inside going over and making sure that they're solid. You don't have to, but these are just generally the things that I find I notice a few hours later after I've cleaned up the brushes and I'm celebrating the achievement and then you go, ah, how did I miss that? Okay. So, ah, that tries with that. That's gonna... Those are the little things that, that eat at me. Well, that's a little bit too light. I am so compelled to want to do something with that face, but I gotta move on and say goodbye. You know, I, when I look at it like that, I, I don't see any problem. Again, whenever I look at it compared to the original, then all you see is the faults, right? That's why it's nice just after a certain period is just let go of the original. Let the original have its own life and let yours take on its own life as well. Oh, remember I said I was gonna do this back here. I think I, I'm going to need to do that. Otherwise, that's going to drive me nuts as well. If I'm going to spend that time doing it, I might as well get the right color. I'm going to get... Uh, so I'm going to mix some cold yellow. And cold... Red together. And then need some white. Oh, 
not quite as electric as I was hoping it to be, but I'm going to race against time here. So, So I'm painting over top of these lines that I had a kind of a pink in. I've got this now a bit more of a peachy color here. And that reacts quite well to the blue that it's next to. Gives it kind of a vibrational quality. Probably could have left the the yellow out of this and just did magenta and white, but I don't even know why I put yellow in there. I think I wanted just a, a little bit more of a. I don't know. I don't know why I did that. It's not really the color that was there, but I think it's because I've been painting for almost four hours, so my brain is atrophied and hungry and dehydrated you know that's what happens to the human body uh, okay. It does make a difference. It is really improving this painting, so I am glad I'm taking this extra couple of minutes to do it because it's those are the little details. You know, after you spend a few hours on a painting, you're just like, you know what? Might as well just finish it off. Do it right. Okay, so let's let's take a look. We got that one now finished, and let's move them both onto the table for one final look. A couple of Ted Harrison paintings. I'm so excited. Ted Harrison. I'm gonna get my pen out here. Okay. It's a mouthful. <laughs> 
Da -da. Two more finished paintings. And I don't even know what we're, what are we doing on Thursday? Uh, so, so focused on one thing at a time. Oh, um, yeah, Henrietta Mabel May, we're going to be doing a painting of hers on Thursday. Let's just move these out of the way. So in a couple of days, we're going to be doing a landscape painting um, by a great Canadian artist, Henrietta Mabel May, or Mabel May, or H. Mabel May, depending on, on uh, how you want to refer to her. And that's going to be a lot of fun. It's going to be a, a, a little bit very different type of landscape than we just painted today. So that's I love going from one to the other so that we can really see kind of the broad range of possibilities that are available to us as artists. Um, in terms of style and technique, etc. So that hopefully, uh, if you're painting along and you're doing every painting with me, you really get a full range of, um, of possibilities. So you can start to figure out what is what appeals to you most, what, what comes easiest to you, what do you find most challenging. And if it's really challenging, is that a bad thing or a good thing? I don't know, it's up to you. I love being challenged. Some of these paintings have been way harder than I expected, and some of them have been easier than I expected. And um, I honestly feel like the more and more I do, it m presents more and more possibilities of how my own personal artwork could go, because there's um, I'm getting better at certain techniques that uh, I didn't usually use prior to doing these uh, episodes. Anyway... Thank you everyone for painting along with me. We will see you guys in a couple of days on Thursday. If you liked the episode, remember to like and subscribe to the channel. Hit the notification bell so you know when the new episodes are coming. And ad in the advent of every once in a while, the stream goes down and I have to upload a, a new one in the middle of the episode. You can find it really easy because it'll pop up at the top of your Netflix um, notification there. If you want to contribute a small financial donation, there's a link to PayPal below. You want to send a check or e-transfer or whatever, contact me through the Facebook group or my through my email on my website. Uh, all of those links are in the, the thing down there somewhere. <laughs> okay, everyone, we'll see you guys in a couple of days. Enjoy your evening wherever you are on this beautiful planet Earth. We will see you guys again very soon. Good night. Thanks for joining me.